yes, thank you very much. Um, also, thanks to the organizers for putting together this very nice conference. So I hope there's going to be more stuff like that where like joint mathematics and string theory um, conference will take place. So today I'm going to talk about uh, landscape study studies um, on 0 2 hydraulic string models. This is work which um, was done the last couple of months with, uh, co in collaboration together with Ralf Blumhagen and also re um, is related to work which is going to uh, which is in progress, which I'm doing with um, Benjamin Joka right now. So even though done already, um, let me first introduce very quickly the idea of hydraulic string model building. So <coughs> in the hydraulic models, um, we need a Calabi-Yau threefold along with a holomorphic vector bundle. So this vector bundle comes with a structure group, and this structure group will break the gauge group EH, which comes with our hydraulic model, down to some gut group well, E6, SU, uh, SO10, or SU5. So what you want to do is to calculate um, the chiral spectrum. You can do it by uh, calculate the cohomology of certain vector bundles listed here. And well, in fact, many of such um, holomorphic vector bundles you can um, build by monad constructions, which means that you have line bundles as um, building blocks of your um, vector bundle. And since um, these are only line bundles, everything what you want to calculate is line bundle cohomology. And as you have heard from Benjamin before, uh, we can use our algorithm in order to do that, in order to calculate um, the relevant physical data of these models. So let me first of all tell you what a monad construction is. So let's start easy with the tangent bundle. Uh, we take a base space, a, com a complete intersection, manifold in a toric variety that's called the base M. Um, in a section of hypersurfaces GJ here with multi-degrees SJ. And the tangent bundle of this space M is simply given by the cohomology of the Euler complex, which is written down here. So what we have here are line bundles um, on um, our on certain, uh, well, with certain degrees. So the degrees here uh, precisely correspond to the, degrees, uh, to the degrees of our homogeneous um, hypersurfaces that build our base space. And these QI are simply the degrees of our homogeneous coordinates in our ambient toric variety. So the monad is very similar, but only that we don't have to use these specific line bundles. We can just put basically any line bundle here and take the cohomology of the complex and get our holomorphic vector bundle this way. So that's the basic idea. So how do we get these monads um, um, from physics, basically? So they're actually given by a vacuum configuration of um, a superpotential uh, of a um, two-dimensional field theory, which is a gauge linear sigma model. So in this gauge linear sigma model, we have a superpotential, which is written here. There are superfields, um, which are charged under R, U1, um, gauge groups, and we also have homogeneous functions gj and fal in our superpotential. So we can see in th those two terms, um, we have like always superfield and homogeneous function, and here two different superfields um, together with uh, this other homogeneous function. So besides this superpotential, um, we also have a bosonic potential, which splits in into two terms. So the first terms um, contains parameters, which are known as Fayet Eliopoulos parameters. So we have precisely R of them, so as the number of U1 gauge symmetries we have. And <coughs> basically, um, the minimum of this um, bosonic potential depends on the choice of our Fayet Eliopoulos parameters, Xi. So different choices, different vacua. One possible vacuum here is, um, well, one possible phase, we call it also phases, is the geometric phase. If, if you, for, for um, certain models, choose all these parameters to be larger than, than zero, and you consider the vacuum configuration, you actually get, as resulting space, a complete intersection um, of hypersurfaces in a toric variety. So how can we sort of map the fields in our gauge linear sigma model with the toric data um, I just shown you in this monad. So we can do this by, um, well, I've seen our fields x in the potential. So the bosonic components of these fields basically um, are the homogeneous coordinates of our toric variety. 
So it's actually forced by this condition to be a toric variety. And the homogeneous functions we have seen in the superpotential are also forced to be zero by this um, condition. And they will play the role of the intersections in our toric variety. So these will sort of um, be all zero and intersect. So we get a sub-variety in this space. Finally, the charges of our superfields lambda and p we have, we've, we have found here um, sort of determine the line bundle degrees we have found in our monad. So basically, um, they sort of determine um, how our bundle looks like. And also, these functions FAL, which appear in the monad up there, um, are given by those FALs I just showed you in the superpotential of the gauge linear sigma model. There's one condition you have to, um, that has to be satisfied in the geometric phase. The first one, well, it's, it's in order to um, uh, prevent the model from anomalies. So you don't want anomalies in your theory. So you have to make sure that um, the first term class of your tangent bundle uh, actually vanishes. So this makes sure that your sub-variety is um, actually a Calabi-Yau space. And the second one constrains your bundle um, to have the same um, second um, term class in the tangent bundle. So. Um, there's um, not only the geometric phase, so let's step a bit, uh, once, uh, let's go one step back, go to the general superpotential here. Um, you can show that for a, a certain choice of your Fayet-Lopez parameters, it actually happens that one of those fields, for instance, this P1, is not allowed to vanish at the vacuum, um, at the vacuum of this potential. So it obtains a vacuum expectation value at F. Um, you are then able actually to um, write down an effective, uh, an effective superpotential in a certain region of your modular space that does not contain this P1 anymore. So you can basically integrate it out from this potential. And well, in this case, well, we have, we have seen that those two terms um, don't differ so much. So they only differ by this P basically and some of those functions. So if you go to this specific region, modular space, and put the VEF on your um, field P1, you can't really, um, um, uh, you can't really, there's really no difference between those terms. So, but uh, we have seen before these Fs um, were actually defining polynomials for your bundle, and these GJs were actually hypersurface equations. So, but since at this point we can't really tell um, which is which, um, well, there's actually no point to assuming that the one is a hypersurface or the, or the other is um, like a bundle. Um, defining equation. So they are sort of um, appearing on the uh, on an equal footing. So we can sort of treat them as the same. And well, there's actually um, um, actually there is a model um, that also has this phase in this specific um, region um, where where, actually, where exactly this happens, where the G's that appeared before as hypersurface equations appear now as um, um, equations in the bundle. So bundle defining equations basically. So we basically get, if we go back to our geometric, uh, geometric phase, we get a new model, which is a new, mo new monad. Um, so we have a new um, base manifold. So I call it M tilde here. So where now those two functions are hypersurface equations, along with the other um, remaining um, hypersurface equations we had before. And um, the two Fs we sort of exchanged are now given by the, o, uh, the former um, hypersurface equations. So therefore, also um, the bundle changes. So we have actually a topology, topology change of the base and the bundle as well. So those changes. In order to um, have no anomalies in the transformed model, basically, we have to uh, put a little constraint on the exchange of those two um, homogeneous functions, namely um, their multi-degree, which I uh, wrote down as these double bars here. Um, they have to sum up to the same degree. So this is basically in order to um, keep our intersection um, to be Calabial, for instance. So uh, otherwise, it would be something different. You can't really say. OK, so um, yeah, said so we exchanged the roles of these two um, po uh, polynomials, these two pairs of polynomials. Let me um, just um, remark that if we start with a tangent bundle on some base and perform this um, transformation, we usually don't end up at a Calabial with a tan tangent bundle on it. So we usually get um, a non-standard embedding model as the as, um, as transform model. So 
this relation was actually first observed by Distler and Kachu um, for models that shared a Lander Ginsburg phase, where you could sort of um, uh, see quite good that in this phase everything um, looks the same. And well, what we actually did now, we extended this to uh, more generic models. So models that don't share a Lander Ginsburg phase, but share a more general non geometric phase. So, and it's the procedure basically works for arbitrary, um, for arbitrary mo models, but we only tested it in like, um, yeah, specific ones. So I'm going to tell you later on which one we did. Okay, so um, this <coughs> allows now for two different interpretations of the situations. So the first one would be that there is actually a transition between two different models sort of through this phase. Um, and the second one is that these two models are actually isomorphic, so are dual descriptions of the same thing. So how should we decide which one it is? Well, we can put some necessary conditions on the fact that we actually have a duality here. Namely, we have to check the chiral spectrum and the dimension of the modular space. So we want the chiral spectrum, the chiral spectrum to match in both models. So we have to calculate those cohomology groups on both sides and compare them. Which, for instance, for SSU, uh, FU, SU3 structure bundle would simply be um, the bundle valued cohomology um, written here. And we also have to match. Um, we have to also have to compare the dimension of the modular space, which is written here. So it's the sum of the two Hodge numbers and the deformations um, of the vector bundle. Well, in case that there are no obstructions, so we heard from Lara before that there might be actually um, uh, um, models where these um, are not all. Um, well, this is not the full modular space, but you have actually a smaller one. So we have some obstructions on your deformations. So let me give a simple example. Um, uh, take a uh, co dimension two um, intersection of a, um, of a degree four and degree two hypersurface in P5, equipped with the tangent um, bundle. So we can calculate the cohomology of this model. So we get, well, the cohomology of the tangent bundle is simply the two Hodge numbers. So we get 89 and 1 as Hodge numbers. And the dimension of our modular space here is, well, sum of the Hodge numbers plus the um, uh, bundle deformations, which ends up at 280 in total. Um, so if you perform our procedure um, um, that we described in the paper, um, we actually um, get an um, intersection of three hypersurfaces now in P5 times P P1, written as here. So these are the degrees, the multi degrees of the hypersurfaces. And our new bundle is now given by this monad. And this certainly is not, a, um, it's not the tangent bundle anymore. So it's a still an SU3 bundle, but it's some, some other bundle. So it's not, not the tangent bundle. So still, if you calculate the cohomology of this bundle, we still get 89.1. And so the full dimension, even though both the Hodge numbers have changed and also the deformation of the bundle, the sum of all of, of, all of them stays the same. So the dimension of the modular spaces is still the same. So this would sort of support um, the second um, possibility that there is actually um, an isomorphism. OK, what did we now exactly do? Um, we applied the proposed procedure to um, generate those models to a, wide, uh, to a to, um, large class of um, tangent bundles on intersections. And um, well, after performing our transformation, we checked the new model for singularities, because it might actually happen that the transformed, models, uh, the transformed model has singularities. So if this happens, we can't really calculate stuff. We would have to blow up these singularities first. Um, then we calculated the chiral spectrum and the full dimension of the modular space of both models and um, compared them. So at the end, we found actually an agreement um, in quite a great number of examples. So the lists we actually scanned through is, first of all, um, a list of hypersurfaces, of color BR hypersurfaces in toric varieties. So we took toric varieties with seven, eight, and nine lattice points, so which was taken from the list um, on Kreuz's website, so was proposed um, um, from Kreuz and Skarke. And second, secondly, um, <coughs> we took a list of co dimension two complete intersections in weighted projective spaces. Um, well, we took like half of, half of the list or something. Let's go through it. So let me show you a little bit of the statistics here, which we found. So for the hypersurface case, we had like 1,085 different classes. So this was the starting points of models. So from those, we, quote, uh, we could sort of um, um, obtain four, uh, about 4,500 um, dual models. So somewhere in those classes. And 
we com when we compared the Kuiper spectrum of those models, we actually found that in 4,144 cases, um, the Kuiper spectrum matched to the original one, which is a match of 100%, because all the others, so the remaining here, they either had no duals or we couldn't calculate them because at some point we are not able to do it anymore. And um, the, full, um, the full agreement um, we found in 95% of all um, calculatable cases, which was um, which was in uh, 1,500 uh, 1, um, models. So this is rather a fun fact: the number of line bundle cohomologies we had to, com to compute. So um, going to the Kodam engine two um, computer sections and um, in weighted projective spaces. We started with 16,000 um, models and calculated the data of um, in total 80, uh, about 80,000 models, compared them to the original ones and found an agreement of 87% for the chiral spectrum. So this is not 100%, so there are certain, um, certain uh, possibili possible, uh, ma um, possible explanations for this not to be 100%. So for instance, we might actually um, still have singularities in our base manifold, so we did sort of um, necessary cross-checks for that, but we have no sufficient check done yet, so it might, might still be possible that there are singular singularities and we couldn't really um, see them. So, but still, 87% of the models had the same. Yes, please? Pardon me? Pardon me? Um, in the moduli, so it's usually just um, just a few, like um, five or ten or something. So it's not, it doesn't really, um, it's not much actually. So yeah, it's a slight slight disagreement. Um, yes, we actually had a look for for those cases, and we could sort of identify um, some of the sources where they came from. So I guess you um, thinking about those um, not not allowed deformations of the bundle. So. Sort of, um, yeah. We are actually working on this right now um, and trying to, to to write down a consistent way to um, sort of um, get it completely right. So to see where actually those wrong com contributions or wrong contributions come from. So it seems to be that they're con that they're connected to local sections of certain line bundles. So yeah. Okay. So yeah, here we got 91% uh, of agreement. So it's. Uh, 20,000 models about, so, and yeah, okay. Um, of course, we needed a lot of line bundle cohomologies to do that. Um, okay, when I plot this, um, we would find something like that. This is um, for the hypersurface case, so each of these lines corresponds to um, one class of models. Each, each dot on every line corresponds to a different model. So since the sum of those two numbers is constant, well, they have all, um, they are all parallel, and well, so yeah not much more to learn from that, actually. So this looks like for the um, computer sections, so can't even learn even less from that, but um, don't mind. <laughs> OK. Um, so let me conclude. So what we presented is actually a proposal how to systematically um, generate so those potential 0, 2 models from given 0, 2 or 2, 2 models. Secondly, we actually gave a proof that our anomaly cancellation conditions stay satisfied by this process, so um, we don't have to worry about that anymore. And we did analysis of a uh, large um, landscape of, of models in order to support that there might be a duality rather than a transition for these, um, for these spaces. So th some further outlook would be, for instance, to um, look deeper into those obstructed um, modu uh, moduli, um, obstructed formations of your bundle or your complex structure or to maybe to see where the mismatch in our, um, in our scan um, originates. And well, second of all, we have not checked the bundle to be stable. So this is one point which should have, would, would have been done, would nice to be, to be done. Um, we, for, for, for the moment, we simply assumed it. So, and since we did a large study, I'm pretty sure that there's um, many cases where it actually happens, but it would be nice to sort of um, get a um, condition when actually this bundle stays stable or when it sort of destabilizes. And of course, um, a sufficient check for smoothness of our base space would be nice in order to really um, make sure that the numbers we calculated are all fine and all okay. So yeah, that would be it for the moment. So thank you for your attention. <coughs>
you're saying that when you specialize to the two two locals, it does not give you mirror symmetry. No, it does not. No, it's simply it, it's different. So mirror symmetry is about gives you a duality between two um, two two models. So we start with a two two model and end up with another zero two model. So and actually the changes of um, of the Hodge numbers are sort of slight. So it's um, it's not that much. It's not that they exchange, um, but um, rather have yeah just some small different changes like five to ten. You start with one pair of the number. How many objects are you to it? Oh, it depends on if um, there are models where there's actually no no possible dual, and we we'll also find some where we have like twenty or something. So, so it always depends on actually how complex your your, your space is and how many hypersurfaces you intersect. Because the more structure you have, the the more freedom you have to sort of exchange data basically yeah, consistently. So.